Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So we've had a great time. This is a super cool way to end uh, with our keynote this year. So if you've been to past workshops, it's uh, it's been studio focused. So we've got Fleming Rasmussen, who we visited in Copenhagen, which is really cool. Barty D2, we had Mark LaPuesta from Nashville. We've had some really, really cool people. So it was really part of our mission was to do something a little different and to get some uh, good live sound. And we hit the biggest home run yeah, yeah. <laughs> ever with uh, with Michelle. So um, and uh, joining up here will be uh, Capital Studio Rachel Capalonga, who's really found a passion for live sound. So I'll bring out Michelle and Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll, we're all mic'd up, so you should be able to hear us, and we've got music tech students working on this. So, um, sound have the worst mic techniques. <laughs> right, right. So, um, yeah, so we've got a bunch of questions planned, and uh, mm -hmm. they will time at the end, so we'll go from there. So, um, I'm just going to start and just kind of let this slide do uh, some of the talking for us. It goes. And this is not even exhaustive. Right. So, these are all the different acts that Michelle has had the both lucky and honor and everything. I think it, the respect from what I'm getting is really mutual that she's been on tour. She's been doing this for a really long time in a really positive way. We talk, kind of talked about this in some of the classes, how about, especially in live sound, there's just a bitterness that can creep into if you've worked at clubs and worked at, and she has none of that. It's amazing. So I applaud you for that, <laughs> keeping that positive. So, I mean, just a, just incredible, incredible from, you know, really interesting uh, beginnings, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about today, to being doing some of, the, some of the biggest shows that we have going around. So I think that's cool. So uh, we'll start with, we've got the slide here of Ashland, PA. And this yeah, so I grew up in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. so I used to go to, like, a bunch of big shows and stuff because they would come to Pittsburgh. So I was like um, exposed to like things in live sound and I became interested in it. And you grew up in this small little town called Ashland. Like, yeah. How did you even find out about like this career? Um, well, I had a passion for music since I was a little kid. I played piano and when I was in high school and tried to figure out what I wanted to do, I was also uh, I also like science. I like taking things apart and figuring out how they worked. So it just kind of dawned on me one day. Um, I didn't want to be a performer because I was terribly shy and I hate being on stage. So um, <laughs> yeah, we may look. <laughs> I just kind of thought, well, if I can make records, that gives me a way to be creatively involved in making really cool music, and then I don't have to be a performer. So I decided I wanted to be a sound engineer. And yes, as you can see, Ashland, tiny little town. Um, when I was growing up, population under four thousand. Um, so there's super no music. Over I just yeah, there there you go. That's where it's, <laughs> that's it's, that's it's about a mile long, about a half a mile wide, middle of nowhere. And you know, for people growing up in that town, you're pretty much limited in opportunities. And uh, you basically graduated from high school, got married, started a family, and worked at a factory or the mall or your parents' business, and that was about it. And none of that worked for me. So I just knew I wanted to get out of there and I wanted to do something more with my life. So I went to the recording workshop and I also went to Full Sail. And while I was at Full Sail, I discovered Live Sound, which I've been to tons of concerts but never really considered that, wow, this is a job I could do. I, I was going to be a recording engineer. And when I was in high school and told my guidance counselor that, they were just like, that's not a real job, you have to pick a career. You know, people in Ashland didn't know, they thought I wanted to be a DJ. So no one understood. <laughs> And at the time as well, um, you know, I came from a really poor family, really, you know, limited background. I don't think picture of my home. <laughs> um, we we had no money, so you know, I my parents didn't buy my first car. I didn't get my first car until I was like 22. You know, um, they didn't put me through school. I had to pay for my education myself. So really humble beginnings, and um, I just I had a dream and a goal, and it was to get into music and get out and travel and see the world. So. The whole reason I'm telling you this is because it doesn't matter, you know, you can, you can make a lot of excuses for yourself, like you can have a lot of doubt and, and say, oh, I'm not this or I'm not that or I am this and I am that. Um, the only limits you have are the ones that you put on yourself. So, you know, if I can do it coming from right where I came from, anybody can do it. So don't get it in your head that you've got all of this against you. I mean, I started out in live sound in the 80s. There were no women engineers, you know, no women on tour. You know, the women who were on tour were generally wives or girlfriends of the band or groupies. So, you know, 
that didn't, it just didn't factor into me. You know, I was like, I had a goal and I was going to achieve that goal no matter what. So just don't let, you know, self-doubt and insecurity stand in your way. If you have a dream and a passion, just do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. So this is you uh, a little bit ago. <laughs> With, uh, so if you're of a certain age, the spin doctors were huge there for a while. Yeah, um, that was my first tour. So it took me about five years of, after I got out of school of working, you know, just around the industry at nightclubs as a stagehand, um, working for, you know, small sound companies. I just worked as much as I could and got my lucky break, which was with the Spin Doctors in 1992. Uh, I got hired to replace, uh, a, the job basically came from a classmate, a guy that I met at Full Sail who knew I wanted to tour and do sound. And he offered me the job. He wanted to get off the tour and go home. And... I started, and a month later, their, their record uh, was in the top 100 on Billboard. So I was there at the right time, the right place, and I grew with them. So my career just kind of grew alongside. But one thing, one big mistake I made, um, when I got my first tour, I kind of took it for granted that the phone was going to keep ringing, you know, and I would start getting more, you know, tours. And I wasn't very good at making, you know, at networking and making connections. So uh, about a year later, when they were taking a break, I had no job. Oh, well, now what do I do? You know, no one's calling me. So I ended up having to take a telemarketing job for about 10 days before I was ready to kill myself. <laughs> um, but I needed to make money. I, I had to pay my bills. So um, it just, you know, kind of was a wake-up call. Like, wow, I really need to make connections when I'm out there. I need to keep up with the people that I meet, the other crew people, the other tour managers and production managers, because that's where the jobs come from. I think one of our guests never said, uh, never eat lunch alone. Yeah. yeah. You know, and those kind of on that tour, like, you know, always eat Connecting with someone. Think what else do we have? Yeah, then you're going to make some good dolls. Good dolls. Yeah. That was only in 2014, so that wasn't too long ago. The short hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you, you, but you know, so there's you getting. Is that you're getting a gold? Yeah, CD, they, uh, is that right? they. That's when they got their first gold record. Actually, it was their second album. So they they gave all of us on the crew a gold album. We were, you know, like the the crew that worked for the Spin Doctors. We were a very tight little family, and we worked for them for about five years. Um, it was always the same people, and we were all very close. So that was a very nice environment because the band was great. We just were all a family. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what was your experience experience like touring? Like, what's your daily routine like on like a big tour, like Gwen Stefani, for example? Okay, Gwen Stefani. Um, our days are pretty long, they're about sixteen hour days. So. For the audio department, we usually start loading at about nine, but you know, lighting, video, those guys start way earlier. So if you like sleeping in, if you like to sleep late, be a back line guy because they're the last ones in. <laughs> but audio, we start loading in um, at nine o'clock, and my system tech puts up the PA, and I'm setting up front of house, um, setting up all my, my console, all my gear. And that tour, I was using an analog desk. I was using a Midas XL4. I don't know if you can see it in the. Uh, there's a, and a tiny, tiny bit in the corner there, you can see the, the console, but you know, it takes a while to set all that stuff up. Um, at the same time, the, the backline guys are setting up all the instruments on stage, and the monitor guys setting up the monitor desk. So once everything is put up, then we do a line check and run through all the inputs, you know, dial in gains, EQ, you know, just kind of get it ready for sound check. Then um, we do sound check with the band, then you have a little bit of time off, and your day is not constant, you know, like on this tour, until you get into a routine, you get about three weeks in, it's kind of hustle all day long because things are coming together slowly. So you're just kind of working through the day. But then as things progress, you get, you know, okay, my console's set up, the backline guys aren't ready, so I got about half an hour, I can just relax, you know. So after sound check, you get a break for dinner, um, get a chance to relax for a bit, then you mix the show and load out as fast as possible. Um, because, you know, you're gonna, the show goes down at 11, so it takes about an hour, hour to two hours to load out. After you load out, you take a shower, you get in the bus, eat some pizza, and go to bed. You know, wake up the next day in the next city and do it all over again. So you're in cool cities, but you're not getting to see this. Yeah, uh, sometimes you are. You know, like basically every day, you know, we're in a different city. Sometimes you play multiple nights in a city. Um, but whenever you have a day off, your your time is your own. So you know, you get a day off in Chicago, go out and get some great Chicago pizza, whatever you want to do. Um, but I've done tours where we've done, you know, five, six shows in a row, you know, and then your day off, you're just sleeping because you're exhausted. So. Yeah. Is this, oh, Mr. Big. This is sure. Mr. Big in Osaka. And this was their 100th show in Japan. So Mr. Big is still quite uh, popular in Japan. Uh, they're one of the few American bands that can play with, most of the, most of the time when bands 
go to Japan, they play Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya, like three of the major cities. When these guys go, they play the entire island. Like they start in Sapporo and spend you know, three weeks there just playing all the major cities in the country. What's uh, some of the favorite places that you've visited? Well, Tori. Ironically, Japan. <laughs> um, I love Japan. It's a really, really cool, cool uh, place. <laughs> um, and uh, Europe. Europe's always fun. It's just it's great going internationally to see, you know, visit different cultures, um, you know, see different places, and, and just meet new people. You know, try you know food from all over the world. It's, it's kind of cool. There's the goal. <laughs> yeah, so, so day in the life. Okay, so this was South America with Mr. Big uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, when you're in, in the U.S. and in Europe, you're usually touring on a tour bus, and it's very comfortable. I mean, tour buses is a, are great. It's that is way better than flying. <laughs> so um, South America, we were there for three weeks, and you have to fly everywhere because, it's, you know, the, the roads aren't great out everywhere, and it's not conducive to tour bus travel. So... When we were on this tour, we had 18 pieces of band equipment that we carried with us, but everything else was provided locally. So we took things like guitars, you know, pedal boards, a snare drum, a stick bag, you know, some drum hardware, and there was 10 of us. And, we, you know, so between the 18 pieces of band gear and our luggage, we had like 30 pieces of stuff to check into the airport every day. So <clears throat> basically, we get there, we do the first show, and we load out our 18 pieces of gear into a van, then we get in another van, we drive an hour back to the hotel, we get to the hotel, it's about 2 a.m., and we have lobby call at 5 a.m. to go back, to go to the airport, and fly to the next city. So, you know, you shower, you take a quick nap, you go down the lobby, you load those 18 pieces of gear out of the luggage closet into a van, you get another van, you drive for an hour to the airport, you stand in line for two or three hours at the check-in counter, checking in all of your gear and your luggage and waiting for the airline to argue with you of how much money it's going to cost to put all your gear on the plane. And, and luckily the tour manager has to deal with that, but we have to wait, you know, while he's doing all that. Um, then you, you know, by that time you get on the plane, you know, fly for a couple hours to the next country and city, go down the baggage claim, load it, you know, all your gear and luggage into a van, get in the van, drive for two, three hours to the hotel, get to the hotel about dinner time, take a shower, grab some food, go to bed, and wake up the next morning, load all that gear into a van. I mean, this is like day after day after day. So what happened was, the, um, the, the, tour, the manager, when he was booking all of our flights, he's booking our flights at like 9 a.m., thinking, well, it's not too early, not realizing that we're not, the shows in, in South America start later, so you go on stage at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And these guys play for three hours. So, you know, we're, the show's finishing at one, we have an hour to load out, get back to the hotel, and then you have to, you know, leave the hotel at 4 or 5 a.m. to get to the airport and get checked in in times for a 9 a.m. flight. So for three weeks, no one got more than three hours of sleep. And this particular photo was we were in, I don't know what, what country, I think Brazil or somewhere, flying to another country. And when we arrived at the airport, every flight was canceled but ours. Like, What's going on? And ours was just delayed. Well, there's a volcano erupting in Chile, so all these planes, they can't fly through the volcanic clouds, and they cancel their flight. Well, I'm like, why was ours not canceled? You know? So it was just hours of waiting to find out when the flight was going to take off, so we all went through security, and there was nowhere to sit, because there's a thousand people in the airport all waiting for their flights as well, so everyone's just sleeping on the floor for about two hours until their flight finally, you know, boarded and took off. This, then this. Yes. Is, this, is, this, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Same tour. <laughs> right. Yeah. Same, yeah. So I think then, yeah. So, then. so yeah, this is home on the road. You know, this is a typical tour bus. You've got your front lounge, which you've got, you know, TVs, uh, kitchen area, you know, refrigerator, microwave. Uh, you've got a bathroom. No number two in the toilet. No, no solids, no paper, no number two, because uh, that can really start to smell when you've got 12 people living on a tour bus. <laughs> Um, then in the bunk area, you can have any configuration. Um, then generally, you have three bunks high, and there's four sections, so there's 12 bunks. Uh, if you don't have 12 people on the bus, if you've only got eight, you can have what we call condo bunks, where they, they make those bunks a little bit higher, so you only have two per section, and you can actually sit up in your bunk, you know, it's really comfortable. Um, then there's a back lounge, which is just a smaller version of the front lounge without the, uh, the kitchen area. So it's, it's pretty comfortable, you know, you can do whatever you want on the bus. You can sleep, you can watch TV, watch movies, drink, eat, you know, you have no stewardess yelling at you, you're not cramped in, so it's, it's a nice way to travel. So what's the longest you've spent, do you know what the longest duration you, in a, 
Like one uh, stint being out? Yeah, the longest I've ever been on the road without going home was 16 weeks. Yeah. One more, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot, yeah. Yeah, usually about four or five weeks, you're kind of at a point where you need a break. You just need to be away from everybody because you're living, you know, on a bus with anywhere to 11 other people. You know, there can be 12 of you on that bus and it gets kind of, you know, crowded. Even if you like the people you're working with, everybody needs a break from each other. Do you get, like, really close with the people that you yeah. work with? Yeah, that is one of um, my favorite parts of the job. You know, you, you become a, a really, you're all out there together working as a team for the same you know, outcome to put on this show. Mm -hmm. So you, you can start a tour with 12 strangers, and at the end of the first week, you know those people better than you know people, friends you've had your whole life because you're living with them 24 seven. So, um, you know, it's good and it's bad because if there's somebody on the tour that doesn't get along well with others, it can really make life miserable. But for the most part, you know, you build these great bonds and relationships with people that you just keep forever. And, you may do, you know, three months on a tour with somebody, you, you have, you know, make great friends, and you don't see that person for three years, and all of a sudden you run into them at a festival, and it's like no time has passed. You're just instantly like, hey, what's going on? And it's like a family reunion, so. I think I have one more there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so tell us what's going on uh, this, in this. <laughs> <laughs> so this was with Goo Goo Dolls. Um, we were in Europe, in England, and this was in Birmingham. We were playing a, a club, and I club that was up on the third floor of a building, and I was carrying a Midas H3000 console that could not fit in the building. <laughs> the load-in was um, the back door, and it was a, a stairway that went almost straight up. It was really, really steep, and the ceiling was very low, so the console was too high to fit, you know, in through the, with the ceiling, and it was too wide if they laid it down. There wasn't a wide enough stairway for people to be on each side carrying it up, so then... They carried it around in the front of the building where there was a big, you know, marble staircase that wound around that was a bit wider. But as we were, you know, the, had 12 stage hands around, and these things weigh about, you know, 1,200 pounds. I mean, in the case, it's heavy. So we had 12 guys around this console trying to, you know, carry it up these stairs. And we got up about four stairs and we're trying to make the turn. And I'm upstairs looking down, watching this, realizing that someone's going to get hurt. This is not smart. You know, this is not a good idea. And the other thing was the club um, was sold out. So they had a little tiny booth and they wanted me to put my console in this booth, which was going to be really difficult to do as well. And I finally said, you know what, let's, you know, let, let me mix outside. Our, the good thing with Goo Goo Dolls is they don't have any amplifiers on stage. So I don't have stage volume that I have to worry about. So pretty much what's coming through the PA is what I'm doing. So. I basically went down outside to the smoking area and they had a <laughs> little shed there, so I set up in there so I was protected from rain if by chance it rained. We were carrying some speakers that we would use as, as front fills, so I put those up on some oil drums so I had some monitors to listen to. <laughs> um, I had my laptop and it had a, that was set up with the laptop on stage so we could do mirrors, like basically I could watch what was going on stage. And uh, when we sound checked, I just, you know, I kind of got a mix happening and I ran upstairs, like run up the three flights of stairs, listen to what it's actually translating to in the, in the room, run back downstairs. And I did that for about an hour just to kind of get my head around, like, what am I doing and what's coming out up there? And then when we started the show, my system tech, he sat in front of house with the ClearCom on, which is a communication system, and was able to tell me, okay, the, the vocals could come up a little bit and I would make the adjustment. All right, the uh, keyboards could come down a bit. So we did that for about the first song and a half, and he's like, all right, it's great, just you know, leave it. So if anything kind of started getting weird, he could just call me and let me know. But it was awesome to be outside, so, you know, surrounded by drums. <laughs> I'm out in the fresh air, I'm, you know, I don't have to listen to loud music, and see, I just can control the level. And, so, so back to the front door, and then you were like, I'll just do it outside? Mm -hmm. That was the next solution? Yeah, I did this once before with um, Indigo Girls. We were doing a show in LA in a theater, and the mix position was up in the balcony. And the way my gear was set up, I had another big analog console, and we called it a sled. So it was a rack that was, you know, this wide and low that the console sat on, but that had all of my outboard equipment. So the, their balcony was cement steps, and they wanted me to use the sled. There was no way, there was just physically no way for me to mix on my console with my gear in their balcony. And they would not let me mix on the floor. So they said, oh, it's fire code, you can't mix in the floor. So I said, all right, I'll mix in the alleyway. And they were like, what? <laughs> and ultimately, they wanted me to use their crappy in-house um, soundboard. I'm like, no, you know, my show is really, you know, is dialed in. I've got 
you know, I think I had at the time like 60 inputs. I'm like, I'm not mixing on your board. You don't have enough channels for one thing. So I set up in the alleyway uh, right off the side of the stage. And again, it was just like the side of the building. So I, you know, doing sound check and I'd run out, you know, the front of the alley and come in the, the back of the club and, and listen to it and run back down. And, and during the show, my assistant tech, he'd go in and listen and he'd come, he'd call me on the walkie talkie and say, okay, sounds great or do this or that. You know, and then there was points in the show where the girls would just do a, a you know, the duo acoustic stuff, so their band would come off stage and they'd come out and hang out with like, oh, this is great. <laughs> so, and this was back when people still smoked in the club. Say, right, right. So it was awesome for me because I'm out in the fresh air, I don't have people smoking near me, and you know. But it's just, you, you gotta kind of be prepared for anything because every day is different. Like, you never know what problems you're gonna run into. So, yeah. Your question, yeah? Um, yeah, so being in this industry, there's not a lot of females. Mm -hmm. What has been your experience being one of the few females in the industry? You know, I, I, it really never occurs to me, because I don't think of myself as a female sound engineer, I'm just a sound engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had a problem. Uh, I've, I've loved the guys I work with, I, you know, they've always treated me with respect. We all we, you know, have respect for each other, because we're all there as a team. Um, you know, if, if I've ever I've gotten any kind of grief, it's usually been from you know, like when I started out and I was working at uh, mixing local bands at, at nightclubs, I'd go in and set up, and then I'd go and leave and have dinner, and I'd come back when the doors open and the band was getting ready to play, and the bouncers would try and charge me a cover, thinking I was someone's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want to believe I was actually working, mm -hmm. and um, you know, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's really it's been great. You know, I, I've loved my my job, and and I've very you know few if any bad moments to remember. That's awesome. Um, do a, like female artists like seek you out for that reason? Um, you know, I've mixed a lot of uh, female artists, and it, it was not so much. I mean, there are some women that do want to have you know women prove they they try to promote that. But my it just kind of happened where um, I, I mixed Joan Osborne, and then I mixed Indigo Girls for about seven years, and I started to get a name for oh she mixes girls with acoustic guitars or singer you know female singers. So people would start calling me for that kind of thing, and. It was great because I got to work with a lot of incredible artists, but at the same time, I just wanted to mix rock and roll. Like, I wanted to mix metal, 80s metal. That was the music that I grew up on. So I really had to work hard to break out of this stereotype. It's like, oh, she's the chick that mixes chicks, you know, mixes chicks. And, and um, it took me a long time to actually get people to hire me to mix, you know, Collective Soul, Fuel, you know, um, bands like that that were much harder and heavier and all male. So it can, yeah, it can work either way. That's cool. I think the story, you had two that, that, that we can touch on that I thought were good that we have learned. One was, so you were starting to get some set success in front of house. And for those who don't know, there's on, on these, some of the bigger tours on, like if I go back uh, to that tour. For those who don't know, so there's the front of house engineer who's mixing what, what the audience hears. And there's also then what's called the monitor engineer, which is mixing, if there's a four person band, they're mixing the whole show for four people. And that's the band, right? That's no one hears their work except the band, and you know, oftentimes you can hear them angrily running to the side of the stage and you know, yelling either you know, the monitors or stage monitors. And I thought you had a really interesting, like you were really driven for a particular career. You and I, I'm not sure where in your career you can kind of comment on this as after spin doctors, but work wasn't there for front of house. You were in between tours, and people were calling her up. Hey, can you come do monitors? Can you talk about? It? Yeah, um, you know it's. The job is very similar, and, but different at the same time. You know, um, the, all the, the theory behind it, the fundamentals are all the same. You know, signal flow, gain, structure, you know, uh, mixing. But it's opposite ends of the snake is what we like to say. You know, like you said, it's it, when I'm at front of house, I'm mixing one mix for everybody to hear. And when you're on stage, you can be doing 11 different mixes for, every, you know, what's going on on stage. So it's really intense, and you're also you're in the direct line of fire of the musicians. And you kind of have to have, I mean, both jobs, you need, need to have a bit of a thick skin because you need to let a lot of stuff roll off. Um, you know, you've got a guitar player who's screaming at you all night that it sounds terrible. And you have to be able to know that, oh, he, it's not me because it's the same as it was last night, but he just had a fight with his girlfriend before he went on stage and he's taking it out on me. So, you know, stuff like that happens, but the monitor engineer deals with that way more. You know, you're just kind of like, Target, you know. So, you're like 85 feet that way. Yeah. Really. You can't know what to do. Yeah. So, um, but when I when I started, you know, I started to do front of house. So I started to get pretty good at it. 
Um, there's always a need for, like, there's always way more monitor jobs available. There's just, for whatever reason, it's hard to find good monitor people. So um, I, I was home and I got a call from a sound company saying, hey, can you go out and mix monitors for this tour? I said, well, I'm not a monitor engineer. And they said, well, we know that, but we know you can do it. I said, yeah, I know I can do it, but that's not what I do. And I don't want to have your band be the guinea pig, my guinea pig is my first tour. Because it was, you know, someone who was doing um, theaters. It wasn't like a club band. And I'm like, I'm not going to go out there and, 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 you know, cut my teeth on a band at that level. You know, if I'm going to do this, it needs to be much lower level. And I don't really want to do it anyway, because... What I found out was that if you started to do monitors and you were half decent at it, it was very hard to leave that position and go back to front of house because people always want good monitor engineers. And if you work for a band and you're good at it, they don't want you to leave. You know, they, they want you to stay there. So I saw, you know, my peers struggling to that have mixed front of house and then started doing monitors and getting stuck there for years. So I decided, well, I'm just going to focus on, you know, being a good front of house engineer because you can do both. But it's very few people that are really, really good at both, you know, because you just you spend more time doing one, so then you lose your your skills on the other. And so, it um, you know, I ended up turning down work where I was also in a position where I had, you know, you've got to be um, responsible when you're on tour. You know, you've got to save your money. Like, you know, we don't get health insurance, we don't get paid vacations, we don't get benefits or retirement. You know, it's pretty much you're on your own. You're like a, an independent contractor, and um, so. It's feast or famine sometimes. So, like when you're on the road, you know, making money, you've got no overhead. You're not driving around every day, spending gas money and buying food. Your meals are provided on days that you're working. Um, you're getting a per diem to buy your meals on your days off. So, you can really save up a lot of money. And um, that's good because when you're home and you haven't worked in three months, you're living off your savings. So, I was in a position where I had enough money saved up. I, I didn't have a lot of bills at home. So, I could say, I'm not going to do that monitor job. I'm going to wait and you know and find a front of house job. But at the same time, I was really working hard, you know, keeping up with my contacts, saying, "Hey, I'm available. You know, if you need a front of house engineer." And luckily, it didn't take very long before I found another tour. But you just kind of have to. I just had my my goal in mind was to stay in front of house and do that, and that's what you know drove me. I think, but and then as a contrast, so you had done everything. You had, it sounded like from the way we're talking, all your stories. You've done every audio job. You know, from I mean, from radio stations and cutting commercial ad, you know, and a little bit of studio work, but then all this entertainment. So it was a little bit later where you're like, "This is now my career." Yeah, yeah and actually, so, before I, I started mixing, um, my when I was in school, I, I you know because I played piano, my original thought was, "I'll go on tour as a keyboard tech." I know pianos, I know keyboards, so you know I didn't want the responsibility of being the sound guy. You know, I didn't want to have that responsibility on my shoulders. And it just kind of happened that I ended up into, I started mixing and more and more, and then I got this opportunity, which I was kind of nervous, but I thought, well, hey, it's on the road, and then I'll just go from there. But once I started mixing on tour, I just fell in love with it and, and stayed there. That's awesome. And so then we get some, this is uh, China. Uh -huh. That was, um, yeah, like, so, you know, d doing this job, you get to go to amazing places, you know, places I never expected to go to. Some places I never want to go back to, um, but somebody else is paying the bill, so it's, it's awesome, you know, it's like you're getting paid to do what you love, and someone's, you know, paying for you to travel all over the world. So, uh, this was a couple of years ago, I got to go to, um, we were in Beijing, we had a day off, and we went to Tiananmen Square, which I grew up, you know, I still have a video in mind of the guy standing up to the, the um, tank in Tiananmen Square, what, the late 80s or early 90s, was it? You know, this big revolution going on, and, and to like then go there like 27 years later and stand there and be like, wow, this is history, you know, the Forbidden City, um, which even the Chinese people weren't allowed to go in the Forbidden City until not that long ago. It was, it was you know, this very special um, place that was for the emperors. And so it's, you know, cool things like that make the job really fun. Um, yeah, Rome, you know, we had a day off in Rome, so we all went to toward the Colosseum. Um, that's the Mr. Big Crew. Uh, Russia, we went to Red Square. That was actually during uh, a show day. We were, our, the club we were playing was only a few blocks, so we were able to just jump in a cab. Like, we were finished, we had a couple hours to kill her. Like, we gotta go, we're here, so. <laughs> Panama Canal, which, you know, like, remember in high school, it's like learning about the Panama Canal, and uh, I was there with Big Time Rush. We had a day off, and we, we took a, a cab over, and, you know, it was pretty, pretty cool to see this whole thing and learn about it, you know. Um, and the ABBA Museum, which I don't know if there's any ABBA bands, which I didn't even know existed, but we played Stockholm. This is just back in November. 
And it was um, around the corner from our venue and really, really cool. <clears throat> what else? So let's talk about that worst, some of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> we, want another, we want another dirt, right? I've been, the I've been telling this, this story now for a couple days. Um, I was on tour with Mr. Big, we were in India, and it was our third show, our last show, and we were playing like places that I, you know, I meet Indian people, they've never even heard of these places, and you know, it's kind of like when I say, yeah, I'm from Ashland, but um, we were playing this place called Dimapur, which was on the far northeast corner, it was, it's right on the border of Burma, and um, so we had a production company in India that was traveling with us, we had a promoter and, and a crew that were Indian that were with us everywhere we went, and we were playing all these big, huge polo fields, like an outdoor stadium kind of thing. So we uh, were setting up and doing our sound check during the day and, and looking and like the barricades are all made of bamboo, you know, just twined together and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty shady. And the front of house was on this big scaff riser, but it was like rusty metal and rotted wood. And it's like, okay, so um, we, we finished our sound check, we're backstage and I come out, you know, to do the show about a half an hour before the show starts. And it's packed, and there's the my system tech tells me there's 15,000 people here, but there's 7,000 more outside trying to come in, but they won't let them in because we're at capacity. At the same time, I'm noticing all of the security people are, they look like they're like 12 years old, but they're, they're Indian military police, and they're carrying like machine guns, as, you know, automatic weapons. And I'm looking around, kind of like, I don't know, it's a little nerve wracking, but. The people are, they're all crammed in, they're leaning over the barricades, and these guys are taking their rifles and pushing them back, and I'm thinking like, okay, someone's going to get shot. Um, if I hear anything that sounds like gunfire, just duck. You know, you start thinking like, how do I, what's my escape route? So, we have a, um, the band has an intro song that we play, so when they're ready to, to start, the tour manager calls me, I play the intro, lights go out, and they come on stage. The intro song's about 90 seconds long, so... Just as I'm getting the call to start the song, the system tech then tells me, it's amazing that you guys are here. I'm like, okay, whatever. He's like, no, no, no one ever comes here. <laughs> like, I can kind of see why. He's like, no, nobody ever plays here. You know, it's, it's the only person who ever has played here is Bruce Dickinson, who's the lead singer from Iron Maiden. And he has a solo band. Bruce is known for going to places that, is there a war? Let's go. And I went to Bosnia during the Bosnia crisis. You know, this guy's crazy. Like, he looks for that kind of stuff. So that's a red flag, no problem. And, and then he says to me, he's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, no one ever comes because it's so dangerous. There's two tribes that are fighting all the time. There's so many murders and killings and kidnappings. <laughs> and, and my band's walking on stage. He's like, yeah, but the, the king paid off the two tribal leaders to not fight so we could have this concert. I'm like, oh my. Okay, now try and, mix, try and focus on the show for the next three hours. So luckily, you know, I'm just like, okay, you know, my God. No. And uh, we got through the show, no one got shot, no one died. Um, at the end of the night, though, I should have sent a picture, there's a picture of the barricade, which is a pile of splinters, you know? It was just, just it looked like, you know, the Jack Straw game, like just a big pile of uh, splinters in the middle of the field, but we made it out alive. But then, after we finished, um, we had a bunch of cabs and vans that took us back. It was a 45 mi uh, minute drive to the hotel. So the band goes and the, the crew were all split up in different cabs. So myself and the monitor engineer were in one cab with one of the promoter's people, and we're sitting there waiting for like a half an hour. I'm like, why are we not going? We're exhausted. Like, it's 2 a.m. We want to go back to the hotel because we've got, uh, we have to leave at 9 a.m. So we're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting, and the girl, she explains to us that we have to wait for the other cab because our gear is in a truck, and one of the cabs with our people has to be in front of it, and one has to be behind it, because if not, the truck driver will drive off and steal our equipment. We'll never see it again. <laughs> what? Like, where are, are we? You know, so that's the yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, that's the that's the the touring life. It's yeah. All an adventure. <laughs> yeah. So when I mean when you're starting out spin doctors and I mean you possibly could not have anticipated that, right? No. But, yeah. So what? <clears throat> why? <laughs> why? Um, I mean, why this? Happen? Yeah. Why this life? Why okay. you know what? What about it? I mean. You know, the hours are crazy or inconsistent. Yeah. You know, the pay is crazy or inconsistent. You know, I mean, the situations as far as, you know, I mean, in the 80s and uh, 90s, up until you said you're still mixing analog 24, I mean, huge consoles, mm -hmm. ridiculous amounts of gear, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that, I mean, all that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love the smile on her face. You know, She's like, yeah, you know, right? Like, I don't want... Getting dirty, getting filthy every day, sweating, being in stinky environments and whatever. Um, you know, long hours. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, there's a passion. It's the passion for the music. It's the passion because when you're behind the board and the lights go out and you hear thousands of people screaming, you know, <clears> waiting for that moment when the lights come on, the band's on stage, and the cheering and, and that energy, it, there's nothing like that. When, uh, another example, with Mr. Big, we played in South America and um, in Brazil, and the audiences there are, are insane, and um, it was about 5,000 people in the venue, and we had an opening act, and, and the audience was just into it all night, so after the opening act went off, you know, I'm doing my little line check over the headphones, and the audience is just chanting, Mr. Big, Mr. Big, for half an hour. And as soon as the lights went out, the scream that they let out was so loud that you just got goosebumps, you know? And the band heard it backstage. So all the way in their dressing rooms, they could hear this, like, oh my god. So that gets them all pumped up. So they come out on stage, and they're on fire, and they played one of the best shows of, of that tour. And the audience was singing along and screaming at the top of their lungs the whole night. Like, they were so <coughs> into it. So the whole experience just created this massive ball of energy that, you know, very few things in life give you, and, and you're part of that, and there, it's really, it's hard to explain until you experience it. I mean, you, you've been to a, a show where it was like an amazing show, and you're in the audience, and you feel that energy, so imagine actually having a, a part, or that you're playing a part in that production. So that's, what, that's why, that's, that's it's, why. it's all about passion. Because if you don't have a passion for this, you know, <laughs> there's no way, you're going to be like, what am I doing? Why am I not working at Walmart? You know, it's, it's, this life is crazy. It's insane. I'm living out of a suitcase, you know, 200 days a year. I'm, I'm in these crazy conditions. I'm, I haven't slept in weeks. My, my husband's the production manager for the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So if you're all familiar with that, it's a, a tour that happens two Small months out of the year. Yes. You know, winter time, it's a Christmas show. Well, the guys who do that tour, they rarely get more than three hours of sleep a night for, for two months because they have to load in at 5 a.m. They start, their day starts at 5 a.m. because most of the week they have matinee shows, so they have to open doors at 2. So they've got to be ready at 2 o'clock to have that 3 o'clock show and then another show at 8. And, you know, the days are long and intense, but they love, the show is great. The people, the, the, the company that, you know, manages that tour that they work for is, is great. Um, they know it's a really special show at the part of a great production and you know a lot of these people will come back No matter what tour they're on they'll need to come back to TSO every year just because it's just such a great environment And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a passion That's why yeah. <laughs> I mean you're kind of early in your career Rachel when you hear that Yeah, yeah. I mean I know in your class we had to do the business pitch mm -hmm. And when I did mine I said like my job is to make an entire room of people happy that's honestly why, that's why I like it so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Do you have any questions? Um, I guess a question that I'm thinking about is like why you chose live sound over studio recording. Uh, that's a good question because I started out um, wanting to be a studio engineer and I did a little bit in the very beginning, mostly assisting stuff, but um, once I discovered live, I liked the challenge of having one shot to get right. You know, every show you've got to get it right. You don't have two weeks to work on drum sounds or, you know, a, an entire day to work on one little vocal part. And that to me too, like the monotony of like, oh my God, how many more times can I listen to this one line of a song? You know, it, I like the challenge and the pressure of, of having one day to get it right. Listen to that one line of song. <laughs> over and over. I've got some other questions. Anyone in the audience have a question you can think of? Yeah, go ahead, and I might repeat it for the video, so. Uh, um, how do you, uh, do, like, I guess, two-part of a kind of bone protection question. Uh, how do you protect your hearing, and uh, I guess, how do you protect your personal life from being a little bit of <laughs> She's been married. I've been married for 20 years. Yeah, we've been together for 25, but... Um, well, for one, my husband's in the business, so we both understand the lifestyle. We both know that, yeah, I'm not gonna, we're not going to be together every holiday, every birthday, anniversary. Um, you know, so we also make a commitment to stay in touch with each other. You know, um, when we got together, it was before the days of cell phones and, and, and Skype. You know, I mean, email, or, you know, there wasn't even email yet. So we would, you know, fax each other daily, like, hey, just checking in. Or, or you know, you go to the calling card and say, and, you know, you call each other from a payphone, whatever. Um, even if it's just for five minutes to say, hey, how's your day going? You just check in. 
Um, when Skype and you know email and internet came out, it was great because Skype would spend days off. We could catch up with each other and just hang out, and, um, and we'd work our schedules. And we we were lucky enough that we managed to work together about every other year for a long time. So we'd be on a tour together for a year, and then the next year we'd be on separate tours. And during that time, it kind of balanced out. So when we, we were together, we were together 24-7. So, you know, if you look at the average couple, if both people work, or if one works, you know, you get up in the morning, you're getting ready for work, you have maybe some time together, then you're at work for eight to 10 hours a day, you come home, you're having dinner, maybe an hour or two, then you go to bed. And, you know, you have maybe weekends together, but so it, it's kind of, it, ours just comes in huge chunks of time together, you know. So you gotta be able to get along with each other too when you're, when you're together, because it's, it's like one extreme or the other. And we're both independent enough that, you know, we, we can we have our own lives, like he's got his hobbies, I've got mine, and, and we've got our things that can keep us occupied when we are, like if one of us is home and the other one's on tour. So it's a commitment, like you've just gotta work at it. Um, and the other question was yeah. procuring. Yeah, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's hard to mix with earplugs, and I've done it a few times. I've had a couple instances where I've had bands that had just crazy loud stage volume, and I, you know, got the musician earplugs where it's just, okay, it's 10 dB down or 20 dB, so it, you know, takes everything down rather than just taking out the highs. So I'd get a mix go and I'd pop them in for a little while, but I'd have to keep popping them out just to make sure I'm not overcompensating. Um, when I mixed uh, Big Time Rush, which was this boy band, um, and they're, they're t a TV show. So the audience was made up of like um, 14 to 18,000 screaming girls from the ages of 4 to 24. And these girls just screamed nonstop for four hours. I mean, they didn't care. They just wanted to see their boy up on stage. So at that point, you know, it, it was like 115 dB of screaming all the time. You know, now you can try and mix over that, but then you're going to be hurting people. You're going to yeah. be killing those little girls' ears. So you've got to keep that balance of like, well, I can get louder because i got way more power, but people are going to get hurt. So you have to find this balance of like, make sure they hear the vocals and, you know, the important stuff. But honestly, none of those little girls cared what the snare drum sounded like, you know. So I, there was nights where I would just put my earplugs in and be like, you know what, as long as I'm not in your house, none of these girls are going to complain about the mix because, like, why don't you sound your snare? You know? So you kind, of, you kind of have to, you know, figure out when it's, you know, worth it to risk, you know. Um, but yeah, you just do what you can. If I go to shows or if there's a support act on me for my band, I always have earplugs in. Um, I won't be in front of the house or in the audience without earplugs, unless it's a, you know, if the show's quiet and it's not a noxious volume, then it's no big deal, but anything that's loud, I'll have earplugs in. I'm going to go back to this list of your perform who you worked with, where was that? This one? Yeah, that one, I'll let it go. So, you had mentioned as someone, as far as like, some of the talent, at, at this level, like, is it all these artists, I mean, these are all, I mean, everyone recognizes 95% of those names, right? When they walk in a room, do they just have it? Like, is that why they get to play the stadiums? Or is it like, there's still something manufactured? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> most of them we'll have edit the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, most of those artists, you know, there's something there. Like, like the Melissa Edwards just playing in the, in the dressing room and it's just like. Oh, yeah. You know, here's a perfect example. So, working for Sticks. Um, this is a very much family environment. Like everybody, the guys who work for them, their, their crew, everybody on the crew, um, I was the newest person. The, the newest person before me started 15 years ago. I mean, everybody who's worked for them, they're like, it's a lifetime job. You know, they love the band, the band's great, they treat everybody well. And so every time there's a birthday, we get an ice cream cake, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so they'll, you know, corral everybody into whoever's birthday it is, it's a surprise, and everybody will start singing happy birthday. Now, when you, you know, when we all get together and we're celebrating our friend's birthday and we're singing happy birthday, whatever, when you get a bunch of musicians that can really sing, and you're listening to them harmonize and stuff like how you're like, oh my god. And here's a perfect example, too. With Sticks, we were doing a show um, about two years ago. We, it was just a little tiny uh, venue. It was about 250 seats, not much bigger than this place. And it was like a little, it looked like a chapel, you know, and it was just one, you know, there was no balcony or anything. It was just one, you know, floor, floor seating. And um, about the third or fourth song of the set, the power went out. And there was a huge storm going on outside, so it basically took out the power to the entire area. And the tour manager came out on stage, and because it was so small, he was able to just t you know, yell to the audience, like, everybody just remain calm, we're going to figure out what's happening. So um, 
and myself and the lighting designer, it was a, they also had a, a woman doing lights. So we're at the very back of the venue, and there was a chandelier hanging that was really dimly lit, and that was the emergency lighting. So it was really dark, but just enough to kind of, you know, make out the figures. So about 10 minutes later, the stagehands come rolling um, an upright piano across the stage that they carry up two flights of stairs from the basement in the dark. So they pushed that piano to the front edge of the stage, and the band walked out with the two guitar players wearing acoustic guitars, the drummer carrying um, some shakers and a tambourine, and the bass player walked out, and they put, they, they all stood in the front edge of the stage and sang and played a cappella, like a, a completely acoustic, you know, acoustic guitars, acoustic piano, and just singing and projecting like they, they were in a high school talent show with no <laughs> amplification, and people in the front holding up their cell phones for lighting. <laughs> and I don't know very many bands these days that can pull it off because this band sticks and Mr. Big, there's no track. I mean, what you see when you go see these bands is yeah. everything is being played live. You know, there's no BS behind the scenes. It's what you see is what you get, which is why I, I love working for bands like that. Um, a lot of the artists I've worked for have been, you know, that exactly. But um, even with even saying that, it's like, who can pull that off, you know? You've got these guys up here singing their butts off and playing, and, and the audience was cool enough to be like, okay, let's be quiet and listen. And um, a really cool thing that they were doing was, uh, it was shortly after um, uh, Leonard Cohen died. So they were doing Hallelujah, um, one of his songs, in the middle of the set every night as a tribute. So they, they broke into that, and the audience joined in. I'm, like, I'm getting all choked up just talking about it. The audience joined in on the chorus, and it was just like one of the coolest experiences I've ever it been in my life, you know, everybody in the place just had chills and goosebumps. It's like, wow, this is unique. Like, you know, no one left, no one left and complained that they wanted their money back. They, the band did like five or six songs, and then we had to actually make them leave the stage because we were going to lose emergency power, and we had to empty the building before it was completely black for safety you know, issues. But um, yeah, I mean, like those people got the most unique experience, and and to me, it's like I'll I'll take that over a regular show any night because nobody else saw that, you know. But it's just an example of you know um, having it, you know, having that talent. You kind of you you another thing is kind of like the, when mistakes happen, those are actually the coolest shows. Yeah, you know, like it's funny because I'll be mixing and I'll think the show is amazing, and I'll go backstage after the show and the band is like, oh man, it sucked tonight. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like, oh, well, I screwed up this part, and then you know, bass player's like, I screwed up this part, and like. Well, when they screw up, you know, like if the band's having a great night and it's easy, they can just easily kind of fall into going through the motions and it's just the energy kind of lags and they're just like, yeah, I've been playing these songs for 30 years, whatever. But the minute they screw up um, or something happens, it kind of makes them step up a little bit. It's like now they're playing harder and like you can feel that energy change. So, you know, they thought they had a terrible night, but I'm like, that was one of the best shows you did. You know, and a lot of times what they, you know, they're hypercritical of themselves. So what they think was a screw up, no one else even caught, you know, but at the same time, it, it just kicked up the energy a notch, so it made it a better show. That's awesome. I think we can be done. I've, it's been an amazing experience for me, just feeding off this energy all weekend. She's been super generous with the students here at Capitol, and today, if you got to sit on, on her panel, and just like, like that's the good side of the music industry, right? I mean, there's some lot of dark days and things, and, and when things are going right, and your continued positive energy is super inspiring to me, so. Uh, I, I think it's awesome. So let's give her a round. Yeah. <laughs>